Hey guys, before we get started today, we have uh, two uh, podcasts up. One is exclusive. We filmed at the, or recorded at the end of uh, RTX, and we had some special guests from Couchop join us, Poolside, mm -hmm. for that one. That one's for Patreon supporters and YouTube members only. Check the community tab or Patreon. But we gave away a free one. Yeah, the other one, the, the show we did at RTX. The entire show. free to listen to. You just go to our Patreon, but it's not behind a paywall or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just posted there. So uh, check links, those out. Links down below. Uh, glad to be back, though. And today's episode is sponsored by Fleur and by ExpressVPN. And we'll get into them later. But first, the tech news. What's up, fellow consumers? Hello. The biggest, most important holiday of the year is right around the corner. Who the fuck is ready for Prime Day, baby? Woo! Can't wait to burn my credit card to the ground buying a bunch of shit that I don't need because it has a sale on it. No, I'm not going to do that. On July 15th and 16th, for the fifth year in a row, the world's largest online marketplace is holding its annual Black Friday, but in the middle of summer, for some reason, sales event. Half Christmas. As a way to say thank you to us, the noble, lazy Amazon Prime member who has enabled them to become essentially a mo monopoly over the years. Uh, we did it, guys. We all came together and forced this company into being a monop monopoly. Anyways, while the first couple of Prime Days were basically warehouse clearance sales to clear out a bunch of random crap that was taking up space and not getting purchased enough, like, remember that Fire Phone? You can tilt it and it does things. Uh, the selection of deals, it's obviously gotten slightly better in recent years because this has caught on. Mm -hmm. It's still nothing too exciting, though. It's just a huge, seemingly random selection of mostly household items that you'd only ever buy if you're already in the market for one. And during the sale period, it's never a static, unchanging list of items on sale. Uh, instead, items have finite inventories and are only on sale for a few hours uh, of time before a new item takes their place. It's how they falsely create the uh, doorbuster type yeah. thing. You're fighting other people online for these things. Mm -hmm. It's chaos. It basically forces you to sit on Amazon all day going through dozens of pages of items hitting a refresh button uh, if you just actually want to find something that you like that's on sale. Yeah. I hate it. Of course, if you know anything about how Amazon actually works behind the scenes, how they're able to magically make items appear at your doorstep less than a day after ordering something, you may have some mixed feelings about Amazon trying to get every Prime member on Earth to buy a bunch of shit all at once. Mm -hmm. Amazon fulfillment centers are, at this point, notorious for being not the best places to work. And the reasons why are obvious when you actually stop and consider just how that item managed to get from a gargantuanly large warehouse containing every product on Earth to your door in 24 hours. It's not magic, it's labor. Yes. Uh, back when this was starting to become a, a bit of a PR problem for them a few years back, the stories out of these warehouses were terrible. Uh, workers having to basically like jog 20 miles a day to retrieve items while an app tracked their efficiency. People passing out from dehydration in non-air conditioned 100 degree warehouses in the summer. People just pissing in jugs to avoid getting fired for using the bathroom too much, and so on. Things have reportedly gotten a bit better since then, at least at some of the fulfillment centers. And after enough pressure from the public and from Bernie Sanders about how the low salaries at these warehouses were uh, and how much of a leech Amazon was, uh, they were being on taxpayer-funded government services like food stamps and welfare, Amazon announced they'd actually start paying workers a living wage of $15 an hour. Living wage being a different thing depending on where you live right. and which, which Amazon warehouse yes. you work at. Though they also, uh, they canceled a bunch of existing benefits programs. So uh, it's entirely possible that they ended up spending even less money on employees despite the wage hike. And those employees might be worse off without the benefits. But again, depends on where you live and yeah. you as a person. For a lot of people, I think extra cash in their pocket, probably, probably more important than uh, having some stock options to cash it on in 20 yeah. years. So anyways, plenty of Amazon employees are still not totally pleased with their level of compensation given how much money their labor generates for shareholders and executives. And over in Minnesota, one fulfillment center is letting their grievances be heard by holding a six hour work stoppage on July 15th, the first day of this year's Prime Day. The Twin Cities are gonna be pissed. The fulfillment center in the city of Shakopee, or Shakopee, it's just one of over 100 fulfillment centers across the U.S., so this is not likely to have a huge effect on Amazon's operations. But it is a significant gesture. I mean, over in Europe, where labor unions haven't been crippled by decades of anti-labor regulations and sentiment, Amazon workers are largely unionized, and they go on strike and do short-term work stoppages all the goddamn time, including during Prime Day. But this work stoppage in Minnesota is highly unusual for the U.S., and it has the potential for a ripple effect across the country. And one example of that kind of larger solidarity already happening is the fact that several white-collar Amazon engineers who are based out of Seattle 
who've been fighting for the company to do a better job addressing climate change, uh, they plan to fly out to Minnesota and protest alongside the Shakopee warehouse employees on Prime Day. That's not, no, that's not nothing. Not that's nothing. Good. And yeah, and I, it's entirely possible you're one of those people who thinks workers should just be grateful that they have a job at all and that the only ethical responsibility companies have is getting their shareholders rich. That's basically been the prevailing business ethos of this country for like the last 40 years. So it's understandable if that's the view you hold. You got yours mm -hmm. and you want that sweet bocce ball set. I'm going to start playing bocce ball all the damn time. Once yeah. this set is in my yard, every day is going to be bocce day. Yeah. Prime day is, uh, the slogan for prime day is, I got mine, but I still want a little more. Yeah. But in our opinion, and in an increasing number of people's opinions in the country, labor should be fairly compensated based on the profits that it generates. In the last five years, the value of Amazon stock has gone up by 500%. And Jeff Bezos is by far the richest person on earth, even after giving up $38 billion in his divorce. Not bad, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems entirely possible that Amazon could simultaneously cut their low-level employees in on more of these profits and keep getting filthy rich off of that labor. Why not both? They just end up getting slightly less obscenely rich, and I guess that's a deal breaker for some it, of them. It's such a weird concept to have happy employees who love the company that they're working for and bank on its success so that they can continue to be compensated for Yeah, them. it's not like companies like Costco already fucking do this and still make tons of money. Yeah. Weird. Hmm. Um, but yeah, these kinds of changes, uh, compensating people a little better, they won't happen without either a complete overhaul of U.S. labor laws or, in this case, employees using what little labor protections they still have in this country to strike and make demands. So it's good to see some of these Amazon workers flexing their power to try to get that paper. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what, if any, larger effect this has. Anyways, moving on from uh, large monolithic companies who do billions of dollars in business every single day to a company who we're constantly shocked is still even around, it's time for some movie pass news. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we talked uh, about this a little bit at our RTX panel, which you can, again, listen to on Patreon. It's free for everyone. We just put it there to host it there. But yes, first off, movie pass is, in fact, still around, but also kind of not. <laughs> it's a real Schrodinger's Schro business. <laughs> <laughs> Schrodinger's business. We're getting into quantum physics here. Yeah. Uh, anyways, just before the 4th of July weekend, when a lot of people tend to go to the movies mm -hmm. and the temperatures are rising and you need some AC regardless of what's playing. Yeah. Come to think of it, no wonder they're doing this because fucking movie pass is the perfect pass to just go sit in the AC all day. Yes. Before yes. you had to do it illegally by squatting. They just change it to AC pass. They'd, they'd probably do a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, uh, just before the 4th of July, MoviePass suddenly announced that they were temporarily shutting down service for existing members and not taking any new signups because supposedly they're just going to do a complete revamp of their app. Yeah, now this, of course, is very weird and unusual. Yeah. As you're probably aware, when most apps release updates, it does not involve shutting down service for an indeterminate amount of time while they work on that update. Apps aren't like physical stores that need to close their doors during renovations. Uh, they, can, they can do both, usually. The worst case scenario generally is that a service goes down for a few hours while everything gets switched over to the new version. But MoviePass's Twitter account says that they estimate this process will take several weeks. Uh, how many weeks is several? Is it three? Is it six? Is it 52? It could be anything. Who knows? Those are all, <laughs> those are all amounts of weeks. At MoviePass, we can only afford app developers that have no idea that you can revamp apps while the other app exists you know, and they, then launch yeah. it. They could be shutting things down because all that app development at their office is running up the AC bills. Could be. <laughs> Guys, we can't afford, to, can't afford to give people free movie tickets and run the AC at our offices. We really have to partition out every single thing we do here at MoviePass. Yeah. Anyways, the vagueness of all of this is what is making people question whether MoviePass will be coming back at all, especially considering Spider-Man just came out, The Lion King is coming out a week from now, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Hobbs and Shaw, they're both coming out less than a month after MoviePass goes on hiatus. Yeah. Suspicious. Great timing. Also suspicious, uh, Regal Cinemas, they recently announced MoviePass, a, a clone to MoviePass, and it's supposedly going to launch at the end of July. But when MoviePass was at its peak around two years ago, they had three million subscribers. But by April of this year, that number had dropped to around 225,000, which is not great. And that was in April. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and this is all considering the fact that AMC A-list snubs recently boasted having nearly 800,000 members and growing. Yeah. So the trend for Movie Pass continues downward. Buy the dip, I with, say. With no hope in sight. Didn't someone actually buy the dip? Someone that was watching the show, like, I bought a bunch of stock for like five dollars, and then it was worth twenty cents. Uh, I believe they got delisted, but uh, I'm not sure. Cool. Yeah. If your if your stock becomes garbage, they they take it off. They take it off the stock market. Guys, we, we just can't have AC and this stock yeah. on the same computers. So will MoviePass return after several weeks with a new and improved app that will pull them out of the death spiral they've been in for over a year? Or will they quietly fade out of existence and not return at all? Find out next time on Dragon Ball Z. If yeah. this were any other company, we would assume that this is the end. But the resilience of this company, despite their completely nonsensical business model, has been proven time and time again. And we've been proven wrong. Mm. These people are survivors. And at this point, it feels like we might still be reporting on MoviePass's imminent demise in 2020. So stay tuned, I guess. Season four of Internet Today. Yeah. MoviePass is back, baby, and they're better than ever. I would have never started talking about them in the first place if I knew it was going to take this long to, for them to die. At this point, they should just start a streaming service since everyone else is. Although there's no content left yeah. to push around. Yeah, the, the real estate's all been claimed. <sighs> Sad. Well, they still have Gotti. They got Gotti, and they're going to be living off those Gotti profits forever. forever. Anyways, before we get into more news, it's uh, time for a word from this week's sponsor, starting with Fleur. Now, we all know scent is closely linked to memory. Now, you can create some special memories this summer with the perfect fragrance from Fleur. It's like the French word for flower, just spelled way different, P-H-L-U-R. Fleur makes great smelling clean and sustainable fragrances. Every Fleur scent is for anyone. All that matters is what you like. And unlike other fragrance companies, Fleur is transparent and discloses every ingredient and why it's there. And we got to try out some Fleur scents recently. Uh, my favorites would probably be uh, Hepcat, Moab, and SC59. I'm a big fan of Hepcat. Yeah. Makes me sm smell like the man that my dad thought me'd be, makes me, me, me'd be one day. Makes me want to put on a zoot suit mm -hmm. and start a riot. I, hey, I have a motorcycle. Well, it's in Florida, but I technically have one. And baby... It smells like I have it here. Mm -hmm. Make new <laughs> scent memories with Fleur. Go to Fleur.com today. That's P-H-L-U-R.com. Use promo code NEWSDAY to get 20% off your first custom Fleur sample set. Go to Fleur.com. You click the Try at Home button at the top. You choose three scents that you want to try, and you use promo code NEWSDAY at checkout to save 20%. That also gets you credit towards a full-size bottle of your favorite scent when you come back. Mm -hmm. Again, that is promo code NEWSDAY at Fleur.com to get your first three Fleur fragrance samples at 20% off. P-H-L-U-R.com. And this episode is also sponsored by ExpressVPN. If you believe that you're not being snooped on or that nobody cares about your online data, well then, we're sorry to disappoint you. You're wrong. Because uh, you watch this show and you're clearly smart enough to understand that your privacy is always under attack. Hackers, governments, ad companies, ISPs, they're all gobbling up your data. They're taking all very All valuable. Luckily, though, uh, ExpressVPN is here to protect your online activity through powerful encryption that secures your data. ExpressVPN runs in the background of your computer or phone, and then you use the internet just like you normally would. You download the app, you click to connect, and voila, you are protected. ExpressVPN is fast as hell. We've tested it. It's uh, pretty yeah. damn fast. And it costs less than $7 a month, and it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. ExpressVPN uses new cutting-edge technology called Trusted Server to make sure there's no logs of what you do online. It's time to stop hackers, big brother, and internet companies from grabbing all your data. Take back your online privacy with ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at expressvpn.com slash newsday. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash newsday for three months free with a one-year package. Expressvpn.com slash newsday to learn more. But back to the news and... Uh this summer has featured a ton of website and app outages that, unlike MoviePass, generally get resolved in a few hours. Yeah. And one of the most recent involved Facebook's suite of services, including Instagram and WhatsApp. And that all happened for a good chunk of July 3rd. What made this interesting, though, is, well, at least us interesting, it was the fact that while this was happening, people who were able to get onto Facebook while it was still a broken mess were greeted with a little peek underneath the hood of the old operation. Mm -hmm. Instead of people's photos actually loading in, the empty spaces where photos should go contained these fun little descriptions of what the image may contain. 
Yeah, it's not really news that Facebook uses machine learning algorithms to analyze any photo you uploaded to the service. I mean, that's how they've managed to tag your friends and photos automatically for the last like three years. Mm -hmm. Very fun feature. Uh, it's also not the first time anyone noticed these little AI-generated photo tags like image may contain one person, beard. There's been a Chrome extension to reveal these tags since 2017. Uh, and in fairness, while this is creepy, it's also uh, an accessibility feature that is used to assist vision impaired people navigating Facebook. Mm -hmm. The blind need to network too, you Oh, guys. the bearded one's talking. That's Elliot. Mm -hmm. Now, what isn't known, though, is whether this sort of thing is used to serve targeted ads to users. I mean, because this is Facebook, we would lean towards yes. But yes. these descriptions, at least what can be seen on the user side, seem way too vague to actually serve as ad fodder, aside from maybe beard products. Or non-beard products. Yeah. Oh, this person wears shoes? Bald man need Rogaine. Uh, anyways, elsewhere in big tech, YouTube this week unveiled some extremely long overdue changes to its copyright claim system and also had an executive that uh, called the cops on a black guy. Yeah, oh my God. Uh, the majority of uh, copyright claims on YouTube involve the content ID system, which is most infamously used by movie studios to steal the profits of any video featuring movie footage, regardless of the context or whether it's promotional material or whether anything. Yeah. Just anything. Yeah. Anyways, that's not getting fixed. So no, trailers are not back on the menu for News Dump. Mm -mm. Fool me once, not gonna... don't get fooled again. <laughs> exactly. But copyright claims on YouTube can also be done manually. And that system has also been abused to basically extort YouTube channels. We've reported on this a lot, and it's yeah. bad. The manual claim system was, up until this week, hilariously easy to abuse as long as the claimant was willing to flat out lie. They're like, oh, you might, we might take you to court. Well, joke's on you, buddy. I live in India. Yeah. Good luck prosecuting me. Mm -hmm. But now, a person wanting to do a manual claim has to actually use timestamps to indicate where the supposedly copyrighted material is. I mean, of course, this can still be abused by bad actors, but it seems like it may now be easier to dispute. And in cases of legitimate copyright claims, it'll be easier for people to remove or mute the offending sections of video to avoid losing all that precious revenue from their video. This is a good... Step. Good tiny step that's like five years overdue. Listen, we now give, just fix the rest of it. We give YouTube shit all the time. It's finally a chance to say, good job. Slightly good job. Yeah, it's still a wiggle, mm -hmm. but wiggles have room yeah. to grow. And moving on to some gaming news. Gamers. What's up, gamers? This week, Nintendo revealed the Nintendo Switch Lite which will cost $199, which is $100 less than the standard model, and it's going to be released on September 20th. The price drop is the result of several key features being downgraded or removed entirely, though, which makes sense. Now, much like the cheaper version of the Nintendo 3DS removing the whole 3D aspect, <laughs> the Nintendo Switch Lite betrays its namesake by not being switchable at all. The Joy-Cons are attached to the screen and not removable, and you can't dock the Switch Lite to connect to a TV. It is a mobile device. This is for dads who are sick of their sons using that damn TV all the time. I mean, you I, got a screen right there. I I would say 90% of the time I it is undocked and I'm using it on mobile because I'm on a flight or something. Mm -hmm. But it runs well on the dock. It's fine. Uh, the Switch Lite's also slightly smaller. It's got a 5.5 inch screen compared to the original 6.2 inch screen. There's no kickstand. The bolted-on Joy-Cons feature neither rumble nor infrared, and most egregiously, there's no Labo support. I can't hook this to my face? I can't. What am I supposed to do with all this cardboard now? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to play games like Just Dance or 1-2-Switch, you can with external Joy-Cons, but really, what would be the point? Yeah, the external Joy-Cons are like $70 on their own. You can just <laughs> yeah. get the full-on Switch. And just, the tiny-ass screen. Yeah. Okay, what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, though, the battery life is slightly improved, and a lot of people are pretty stoked about there being an actual D-pad on the left controller. Uh, also, the color options are pretty cool, though mm. it would be nice if they just went all in and had NES, SNES, and old-school Game Boy color options as well, like these mock-ups from IGN, which look awesome. Which you can which you can do with the original Switch because the Joy-Cons come off, and you can have them shipped in and painted or get different face plates yeah. and stuff. Anyways, uh, a lot of these sacrifices in the Switch Lite, they're going to be deal breakers for a lot of people, but those people also probably already own a Switch. This is clearly for little kids with a tendency to break shit or for people that are just looking for a mobile gaming console to play on the bus or the plane. Uh, so whatever, cool. If this was an option initially when it first came out, I probably would have bought this one. Yeah, if, I'm I considering mean, it. The screen size is... I like the screen size of the, the one that I have. It'd be a kind of a downgrade for that, but better battery life is great. Yeah. And the kickstand doesn't matter that much if you're playing 
mobile because the the thing I use is like a fifteen or twenty dollar dock thing. Yeah. And it actually levels it up and makes it look right. And uh, if any slight movement on a train or a bus or a plane, it's just gonna knock that kickstand over. Yeah. So uh, or an earthquake in LA knocks it over. This thing's very sturdy and you can charge while it's sitting up there. Oh wow. So it's uh, much better than the kickstand. The kickstand's fucking garbage. Anyways, there's still the rumored Switch Pro that's supposedly in the works, though Nintendo clarified this week that they won't be releasing any other new Switch consoles this year. Uh, Based on FCC filings, it does look like the standard Switch may get an upgraded processor sometime soon, which would be cool. Yeah. Pretty good life cycle on that thing. Yeah, and I mean, the, the Switch Pro, it seems like they're going to have to do that, given that the current mainstream console cycle is so close to the end. Like, yeah. the, the standard Switch isn't even HD. <laughs> Still, I know we smashed one. It is it is a fucking great console. I played the Messenger the entire flight to Austin and back. Time flew by. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I slept. Meanwhile, Microsoft's cloud gaming project, xCloud, launches this October, and it promises the same thing as Google Stadia, Stadia which comes out a few weeks later. Uh, the ability to play console-quality games without needing a console... You do it on your computer, your phone, your smart TV. Uh, The setup for phones, aside from using on-screen touch controls, has so far been demonstrated using a phone clip attached to an Xbox One controller. But earlier this week, some Microsoft patents and research were uncovered showing that they may also follow the Nintendo Switch model with a set of Xbox-style controllers that attach to the sides of a phone. The research paper even says, quote, the success of the Switch is testament to the value of mobile gaming with physical controls. So now all you Nintendo stands have some more ammo for your online arguments about which console is best. Nintendo is coming up with these great ideas, and if they weren't great, why would Microsoft be stealing all of them? Exactly. So, have you seen that phone? I think it's the LG where you can, like, it's the dumbest innovation ever. And it's all the marketing is about is, like, you can hover control things on the phone. Why would I want to do that? Exactly. Exactly. What is the fucking point? Yeah. Anyways, finally, in some old school, new school tech news, it's highly likely you, the person watching this, were born into a world where cassette tapes were already a complete irrelevant audio medium. But shockingly, there's a decent number of people who still swear by them. Uh, Some of them are people who assembled vast music collections in the 80s and just refused to start over. Others enjoy cassettes for more philosophical reasons. The amount of choice available on services like Spotify is overwhelming and tapes allow them to enjoy music they've very deliberately chosen to listen to while disconnecting from the internet. It is nice. Mm-hmm. Like, I I mean, even going back like 10 years, I do miss like the fact that an iPod wouldn't pause my music anytime a fucking notification comes up. Yeah. Well. Anyway, in an age where CDs are rapidly dying off, cassette tape sales have actually gone up in recent years with 19% growth in 2018. It's just like <laughs> vinyl in the past 15 yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, Still, it is a bit surprising that a new Kickstarter for the first ever Bluetooth cassette tape player has managed to get five times the amount of funding that they were seeking after just a few days. The Kickstarter page for the It's OK Bluetooth (laughs) cassette recorder from Hong Kong-based company Nim Labs leans very heavily on vaporwave aesthetics, and uh, the player itself is designed with a clear cassette dock to really showcase the fact that this is a tape I'm listening to right now. Look at it move. It's nearly... 800 backers have pledged over $64,000 to get their hands on this thing. And in an age where vinyl records and instant film cameras are still extremely popular with some people, it's no surprise, really, that there's enough people out there who love tapes and also love Bluetooth headphones to justify this product existing. Does it come with a really expensive pencil so you can rewind the tape if you leave your uh, cassette player at home? No. Well, but you can record, uh, you, you, can, it ha- you can record, like, your own voice or anything. It's got a little microphone on it. Yeah. It comes with one blank 80-minute tape. There you go. Uh, oh, or you could just go on eBay and buy an actual cassette player. I don't know if there's a lot of those around anymore. I'm sure that there and are. And you got to plug in your 3.5-millimeter headphone jack. Like, ugh. Yeah. Well, if you're real... I want to hear my shitty audio on my brand-new Sonos speakers. <laughs> if you're a real purist, you'll get the you'll get the one off eBay and then use yeah. a, a connecting cable to hook it up to your... Don't speaker. say you listen to music unless you have wax cylinders in your house. Yes. I only listen on that, that <laughs> what, what, uh, what's it called? The thing that the dog looks into? The RCA dog? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I mean. Something a phone? Well, we weren't around for that. Yeah. But, uh, A little bit before my time. Yeah, cassettes were fun. Anyways, like we said at the beginning, uh, over on our Patreon, 
Uh, we have our RTX panel up there for free. Yeah. Go check it out. Anyone can listen to it. And for our donors on Patreon or here on YouTube, uh, there's also a second new podcast for you to listen to. We sat poolside with Lindsay and Alex from Couch Op. Immortal and, HD. And, high def. And Farley was there, and uh, it was great. It was kind of windy, and uh, Elliot chomped chips into the mic at least once or twice, but yeah. it's a good, on solid show. We talk about gamer prez. We talk about everything on there, so uh, yeah. make sure you check that out if you're a Patreon member. If you want to become a Patreon member or a YouTube member, YouTube, click join below the video. Go over to Patreon, drop five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you want, and you'll get access to all of the podcasts that we've done. Uh, so do that if you have, you know, you want to support the show. Got a couple extra bucks in your pocket. We would really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> we tell you to watch our other stuff. It's kind of old now. Sorry, we've been gone for a long time, but you can go watch it anyway. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, enjoy. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye.